The Deuce, Orange is the New Black, Dirty Rock, uh, one of my favorites, Wrist Cutters, uh, a movie. I call it the last Gen X movie. Uh, I mean, it's just such an eclectic, eclectic collection. Um, and I mean, first, I, I sort of want to ask Cinematography for 30 Rock, which is mm -hmm. a, a comedy series, but totally different than anything that's come in the history of sitcoms before. It's not I Love Lucy, the mm -hmm. way it sort of looks, the way it feels. Uh, before I even get into, your, you know, what sort of your mindset was there, you jumped from there to doing stuff like Orange is the New Black and, and The Deuce. What kind of cracker do you have to eat to cleanse your palate between those kinds of projects? Uh, well, it was a, you know, I never had, a, um, I never planned to do as much television mm -hmm. as, uh, as I did. Um, it, it just that as I, as I uh, graduated from, uh, mm -hmm. from film school, um, you know, uh, the industry changed uh, dramatically. Uh, the films that I was hoping I would do uh, started disappearing, uh, and uh, all the uh, independent films and the type of movies that I was watching when I was a student were no longer uh, there. And um, all of a sudden, it was just uh, New York became a TV town. There were a lot of uh, a lot of uh, TV shows coming to New York, and uh, um, at uh, you know, after my my showreel that was was uh, very dark and was uh, assembled from from a lot of uh, dark, uh, you know, a, a small independent uh, New York films, mm -hmm. and uh, I was I, at, at at one point I asked uh, my then agent um, that maybe I should try to uh, uh, find a comedy uh, just to, to do something different, so mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, she said that you know you should. Take a look at your reel. You'll never get a comedy. <laughs> it's impossible. Uh, but I was uh, that year. You mentioned film uh, risk cutters. Uh, uh, that year, I think, is 2006. I was at the uh, uh, Sundance Festival. I had two films in competition. Mm -hmm. One of the two films was uh, Risk Cutters, which was a dark comedy. And uh, director Richard Shepard was there with his film The Matador, and uh, he uh, saw the movie, and uh, and. Um, I, I think he liked the movie, he liked the way it looked, and he was getting ready to shoot um, a big pilot in New York, uh, which was that year, I think, one of the, one of the big pilots. Uh, it was uh, Ugly Betty mm -hmm. for, for, uh, for Touchstone TV, ABC, and uh, he uh, wanted to talk to me about it. And uh, after we met, he, he, liked, um, he liked meeting me, I, I, I guess, and he liked my work, and he wanted me to shoot this pilot, uh, which wasn't easy for him uh, to, to, to convince the studio to, to hire somebody completely unknown who has only done small, uh, dark movies uh, <laughs> to, to now um, have uh, as a cinematographer of, of, uh, of what was supposed to be a, a big, glossy uh, comedy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but Richard um, managed to convince them, uh, which was a big risk for him, and uh, I still you know, have him in uh, in every speech for every mm -hmm. award that I get, um, and he 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 managed to get me on to, on, on this film, uh, on this on this pilot, and uh, uh, my um, it was a uh, it was a first ever TV project I was ever on. I didn't know much about how what what conventions of shooting television uh, was, so I would just shot it the way I would shoot a, a, a feature film. Mm -hmm. And uh, that pilot was very, very successful, uh, and uh, the studio liked the look. And all of a sudden, I was getting uh, uh, offers to do comedies. <laughs> all, you know, all, all, all the offers I was getting was all comedies, and uh, w um, which was really strange and uh, uh, for me. And uh, uh, that's how I got the call to do Thirty Rock. Um, Thirty Rock was a great experience for me because, uh, um, again, s not necessarily something that I was. Mm -hmm. Uh, hoping I would do when I was mm -hmm. when I was just starting up, but it was uh, it was a uh, shot in almost entirely on the stage. I think we had one day on location. I think uh, it was five days per episode and one day on location, so four days on the stage. And uh, I was uh, it was when I started learning about how to shoot on a stage, how to uh, take the stage to you know how to uh, get advantage of shooting on the stage, how to uh, uh, get involved into the design of the sets, 
and uh, also working with multiple cameras. We shot with uh, two cameras. It was the first time I had two cameras ever. So I was learning a lot mm -hmm. on 30 Rock. And uh, my main uh, uh, goal was uh, I j uh, was uh, um, to uh, give, even though it was handheld show and uh, it was mostly medium close-ups and close-up, mm -hmm. I wanted to give it a, a cinematic quality. Yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned that that it was shot on a studio and it was sort of shot the way it sounds traditional television right. because visually watching it, it has the freedom of French New Wave. It has that sort of <laughs> experimentation with, with the shots and and it's one of those shows where you'll see randomly cut to an extra, uh, to an extra wide lens, you know, right. in a, in a close-up right. where it, it was sort of taking advantage of cinematic techniques that sitcoms generally right. didn't take advantage of. So, right. so I mean, it's funny you mentioned... But it, it is probably because I didn't know how the, how you're supposed to yeah. shoot a sitcom. <laughs> and and now did. it's how, it, right. be, because of that, this right. is how every sitcom gets <laughs> shot now. It, it sort of creates uh, a style. Thank you. Yeah, so, so I, I try to shoot it as, a, uh, I would sh as much as possible, as I would shoot on a location. Mm -hmm. I, I, I lit it, uh, you know, I tried to light it in a, a realistic way respecting the light sources mm -hmm. whenever we you know respecting where the windows were and how uh, just the logic of the light of the of each individual set um so um yes giving it the cinematic quality was was was, was uh, something i was i was interested and uh um i was uh, i was on the show for uh for a season and a half i think and uh mm -hmm. then i thought uh it was time for uh, to m for me to move on. Mm -hmm. uh, my camera operator, Matt Clark, who is now a uh, uh, well-established DP, um, uh, took over the show for me. Oh, good! So yeah. Yeah, passing the torch. It's sort of like yes, in the NFL, the coaching. A, the coaching. He was tree. a good friend. He was a great camera operator, and, uh, and we s we went to film school together. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was good for him. It was good for me. So yeah, yeah. So. I mean, it, it's sort of expectations, and this is something I talk with with fellow film geeks a lot. It, is expectations are really changing whereas uh i mean i feel my generation was sort of the last generation where you grew up going to movie theaters and and that was sort of the path where you make a movie you get more bigger budgets you make bigger movies and that's sort of the progress where now you know what kind of movies are going to theaters what kind of movies are going where right. netflix amazon prime it's a totally different world and and kids growing up watching movies today are watching them differently than we watch them. Right, right. So the way you say, you know, you wanted to work in movies, you wanted to work in these indie movies, and now they're sort of not there. Well, people coming up today, they want to work on 30 Rock because they see that, you know, and, and you mentioned you, you didn't want to work in TV. First of all, it's right. it's not TV, it's HBO. Right. <laughs> right. So so it, it's it, it's different. It's There is more of a cinematic feel to what's happening in television now, and I feel right. there's a lot more freedom and experimentation going on in television, right. with style, with genre, with with everything. Uh, once you sort of transition into the more dramatic pieces, Orange Is the New Black, The Deuce, which is shot beautifully, and and uh, especially a show like that where it, it's trying to capture an older era of New York, so there's a lot of CGI that goes along with it, and you sort of have to make everything look pretty right. without actually seeing what the final image is going to be. What sort of experience from Thirty Rock, from from wrist cutters, did you take into there, and and how did you sort of expand your your vocabulary? Right. Well, the, uh, you're asking about the Deuce. Yes, yes. Orange is New Black. Or, these ones, yes. once you sort of right, right, right. Um, Orange is the Bla New Black was again a, a, a show that was uh, all on the stage, mm -hmm. and uh, um, and uh, it was. Uh, Again, the challenge was we had a huge ensemble there, mm -hmm. and uh, there was always a lot of uh, a lot of characters in every scene, and uh, it was uh, the, the one of the one of the challenges was how to cover all the characters um, um, quickly because uh, because it, it, it was important for for every character to get to get yeah. their own coverage, and one of also one of the one of the challenges was you know so it was it, we need we knew we we were going to need to work fast. But also, I didn't want uh, the the prison set to feel like some, you know, sitcom version mm -hmm. of, of of a prison. So um, again, I wanted to light it in a realistic way. And one of the one of the um, techniques, uh, not, not I don't know if it's, it's not really a technique, but I, I I insisted on hard ceilings on all the sets. 
which forced me and everybody else to treat uh, this stage as, as a location, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I based, uh, most of the lighting was based on available lighting that was built in the, into the sets and, uh, and, uh, and we lit, lit either uh, with the practical light sources or through the windows. Um, and uh, it was also great to see the ceilings. So it was also mm -hmm. something that was uh, that, that that I think uh, contributed to the to the to the authenticity of mm -hmm. of, of, of prism um, set. Um, and uh, but again, I I was I was uh, looking forward to uh, get out on the location again, and I was looking for a, I was looking for a show that would allow me to go back to the location. And uh, uh, I uh, stayed on, on Orange is the New Black uh, for season one, I, and uh, w the look was established, and everybody knew, uh, you know, we were all happy with how it was going. So I, I felt it was uh, I was comfortable uh, leaving, uh, and uh, I I got I don't know exactly how I got involved with the with the with the HBO um, HBO series Bored to Death, mm -hmm. uh, which was. Probably the, the the TV show had most fun uh, on. I don't know if you ever saw it, but yeah, it was yeah. it's it's a it was all location based. We shot on every landmark in, in New York mm -hmm. City, uh, and uh, it was each episode felt like a little indie. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was uh, Jonathan Ames, who was the creator of the show, was mm -hmm. a, is a, was a Brooklyn novelist and uh, not uh, not a typical. Hollywood showrunner, so mm -hmm. he assembled a really amazing group of people together, mm -hmm. and uh, it's the only show th that I did that I stayed for the whole three seasons mm -hmm. uh, because it just I had so much ho so much fun uh, doing it, and uh, so I was after that I was I was um, specifically looking for for shows that would uh, that would allow me to do something that I haven't done before or that are all, uh, based on location, so. Um, I think I did uh, uh, Marco Polo for Netflix next, um, and uh, this was a uh, this was a uh, just stop me when I when I'm <laughs> when no I'm no please <laughs> please it's so um, which was uh, when when I got a call for Marco Polo I thought that this was so different from anything I've done before and uh, and uh, it was you know. Um, uh, a 13th century show with uh, a lot of stunts, with uh, huge battle scenes, and uh, all the things that I've never done. Uh, and uh, I was excited about uh, uh, the opportunity. It was different from other shows that I've done because it was um, it was so massive that, uh, that in order to to complete the season in six months, uh, we needed to have two full units, uh, and we had uh, so it was two DPs. Uh, one DP was shooting. Uh, would be shooting episode three, and the other DP would be shooting episode mm -hmm. five at the same time with a with a separate unit. And uh, because there was no pilot, it was this new Netflix model that Netflix Netflix uh, uh, introduced, where it just goes straight into the series. We had to figure out as we were shooting what the how to uh, how to make this look like a one mm -hmm. one show. And uh, the other DP was a French DP, uh, Romain Le Courba. Mm -hmm. uh, Completely different, uh, different uh, style of shooting. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was the first time after school, basically, that I had to watch somebody else uh, <laughs> shoot, and uh, th so I was learning from him. He was learning from me, and uh, we were trying to figure out how to, uh, as we were shooting our Wrestling separate over, episodes, over lights and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it was j it, we became really great. For, you know, a situation that could have been really difficult or a nightmare mm -hmm. uh, turned out to be. Uh, uh, one of the greatest experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and with a show like that, I'm curious because obviously, you know, we're all lovers of cinema. That's why we went into it. So you're obviously looking back at stuff, you know, images that you liked in that style. And anything that takes place before sort of the light bulb era is, I mean, there was movies before Barry Lyndon and then after Barry Lyndon. Right, right. So w when you're trying to light something where, you know, it, it takes place like in the 14th century, 13th right. century, how much do you have to fight yourself when to say, you know, let's get more lighting, let's get more artificial lighting, or that doesn't feel natural to what we'd be doing here. Let's just get right. candles in there and, right. and run with it. I tried to be as uh, as respectful to the light source, original light sources as possible. I learned 
uh, well, should because you know there basically you have three sources of light. It's you mm-hmm. have daylight, moonlight, and and different forms of firelight, mm-hmm. uh, a candle or a torch, and um, which is something that uh, that the other DP and uh, and myself we ha- we had to figure out what the exact color of uh, of those light sources is going to be. So we. Because we were lighting in a totally different way, I would I would be lighting ex- exclusively through the windows and the very little light uh, on the on, on the floor. Um, he had a different approach. So, but rather than trying to force different lighting styles, we we, we decided to uh, agree on the on the on the color of these light sources. <coughs> so um, so we decided what exactly how daylight looks at this time of the mm-hmm. day. What's the color of the moonlight and what's the color of 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 the, f- of the flame. And uh, that was kind of the color of light was a unifying unifying mm-hmm. thing for the for, 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 for the for this, uh, for the visual style. Um, I learned, you know, I wanted because now we were getting these super fast cameras, and uh, you know, it was a you know 4K RAW just mm-hmm. became a thing, and uh, it was all of a sudden it was really possible to shoot at extremely low low light levels. Mm-hmm. So it was it was, and we also. Um, uh, at, at the end of season one, we learned that uh, the, the, that the s- uh, show is going to be graded in HDR. So all of a sudden, you had this extreme latitude. You could shoot at really low light levels, and I and I experimented with with uh, shooting with only uh, you know c- uh, f- uh, torches and 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 and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and braziers and candles. And I learned that sometimes uh, it looks actually less realistic <laughs> when you when you use a l- real light source uh, yeah. because it's uh, we're not conditioned to it. Where we're conditioned to seeing the stuff lit in a certain way, and and that's what we sort of exactly. And the sort flicker of sometimes you, gets you film the myth, not the reality. After that's a right. certain while, th- that's right. And the 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 the, 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 the flicker sometimes mm-hmm. gets a little bit distract distracting. You want to be able to control the flicker, and not in every scene you want to have the same flicker. You know, yeah. if it's if it's so, you want to adjust the dramatic. I think of like Easy Rider. There's a famous scene where they're all sitting by a campfire, passing right. around the joint, and then they start coughing because of the smoke from the real fire. <laughs> right. And they start saying, "Oh, this fire's really getting in my eyes over here," right. you know. But they right. kept rolling, rolling the cameras. Right. And you mentioned latitude, just for some listeners who who don't know, because mm-hmm. my wife, whenever I bring something up, she's like, "I don't know what the hell you're talking about." So I then have to put on my my professor hat. Uh, and latitude is something that I feel right now is especially important because. It's the one thing that I feel digital cameras really were lacking when when the whole argument digital yeah. versus film, yes. uh, resolution stuff like that, four K, eight K. People are watching stuff on their cell phones anyway right, right now, right. but latitude is really uh, it's sort of the the quickest way I can describe it is how many stops of light. It's how much can you see in the darkness? How much can you see in the light? What, right. What's the sort of range of of exposure? Right. Uh, the the detail in the shadows, and I, I feel Black Magic just came out with the the. The Mini Pro and the the yeah. they had the Ursa Mini and the Mini Pro, mm. and it's 15 stops of right. light, which which I think is going to give a, a lot of, you know, independent filmmakers a lot of sort of the the slacker school, the clerk school of filmmakers out right. there, uh, which I'm proudly a part of, an opportunity to sort of start creating images that otherwise they didn't have an opportunity right. to. Well, th- there's going to be new challenges uh, when, when you uh, have all this latitude because mm-hmm. you don't always want to see everything. Yeah. You don't, so you still need you'll still need to be able to control the contrast. Mm-hmm. And, uh, even shooting at a very low light levels, it's, it's a completely uh, new set of problems that you have to now uh, deal with. Uh, one is also the color of the, l- of, the of, of the light that's becoming more and more important because you're mm-hmm. more relying on the light so- color of the light source. You have to match it exactly, and you have. Uh, so, um, you are still um, you are in a new territory, but you still need to con- control the same elements. I think mm-hmm. to create a cinematic image. Um, and I mean, because of the technology, you're able to see everything as you're shooting it. Right, you, you can sort of edit on set and and make choices that you might not have had to make before because you had to wait for the dailies at at the end of the day uh do do you feel there's sort of less of the complacency where it's okay this is what we have let's go based off of that where now because you can tweak so much that that it just added a whole new level of of micromanagement to a production 
there is that mentality of uh, you know w we just need to get good enough uh, footage on the on the on the set and then we'll deal with it later. I don't believe in that for mm -hmm. for many reasons. W uh, the main reason is I think certain decisions have to be made on the set uh, while everybody's there, while the directors are there, actors are there. Uh, when we're all here together, we have to. Um, make certain creative decisions and then we need to be able to protect them and carry them over to the, to the end and that's uh, what more and more is my main focus in pre-production is the post-production mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, i'm trying to uh, uh I'm, I'm trying to make sure make sure that the workflow to 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 to, to uh, design workflow that will protect those ideas well, at this point in the episode, Vanya started talking about uh, Crazy Rich Asians, and I had some great questions for him. Unfortunately, we had to change locations and the, the recording malfunction, so all of that is unfortunately lost. However, I definitely want you to be able to, to sort of experience what I got to experience, some, some great stories from a, a great director of photography. Unfortunately, my memory is still uh, strong enough that I can relay a uh, half an hour conversation that took place uh, a few days ago. So uh, a question I had for him was watching Crazy Rich Asians, something I noticed was that the aspect ratio wasn't what you'd expect, uh, you know, from, from a romantic comedy. Uh, specifically, it, I, I saw that the movie was shot anamorphic, and then I looked it up and, and saw what lenses it was filmed on. Uh, and as a quick explainer, uh, aspect ratio is sort of the shape of the the frame that you're watching when you're watching a movie the, the shape of your tv hd tv is 16 by 9 when you see the black bars on the top and bottom that's a different shape to the frame and there's different ways to accomplish that one of them is anamorphic and, and the way anamorphic lenses work is they sort of capture a larger image and squeeze it onto the regular frame size and then when you're editing it you de-squeeze it so you're sort of capturing more image onto the same amount of plane uh, and it's traditionally used for epic films. For, uh, it was used a lot in the great sword and sandal movies, the Roman epics and movies like you'd expect it to see it in Spartacus and something like that. So when I saw that anamorphic was the format used for uh, this romantic comedy, I found it very interesting, a very interesting choice. And, and I asked him why. And he said, and it was very cool to, to hear these stories because he's from Croatia originally and growing up, when he'd watch movies on TV, all the big epics were always anamorphic. And the reason why he knew that was, for, for one reason or another, uh, he, he mentioned that it would go from squeeze to de squeeze They would actually show the original uh, squeezed version because they had to cut back and forth between the subtitles and the titles. So you would actually see the, the, the version of the movie you're not supposed to, just the way that it's captured, the squeezed footage, and that's how he knew that this was this great big epic movie. So when they sort of came, when he came across this project, he he started looking at the scope of it and realized it it is a pretty epic movie. I mean, it's a romantic comedy as a genre, but it's dealing with larger than life characters and larger than life lifestyle. And he really wanted to show that. He wanted to show the grandiosity of it, and and he felt this was the perfect opportunity to sort of use these anamorphic lenses and and thinking back to the movie it makes a lot of sense because it, it is about sort of people who who sort of sit on top of the world and if that's not epic i don't know what is uh, i just found it interesting because the, the movie was groundbreaking in so many ways but just the you know the technical side of it that you don't notice unless you're just a film geek sitting film geek sitting there thinking well oh okay we're on the 25 millimeter lens here we're on the 85 millimeter lens there and that's something you start realizing how the how the hot dog is made and it was really cool to be able to hear um, from the director of photography himself why some of these choices were made i also asked him because watching the movie some of the shots to me just really reminded me of a wes anderson movie uh wide lenses uh very symmetrical framing uh very specific set design everything to draw your eye in a certain way and again vanya sort of smiled because a lot of this was done by design and it was for that very same reason where this movie even though it's a romantic comedy the setting of it is so important it sort of sets up the humor of everything and the setting is this sort of very over the top very 
everything is controlled, everything is under control, and everything is over controlled, and and that's how they wanted to show it through the visual side of it, and and it, it was just great hearing hearing the story of of how he made these decisions and and how it sort of comes across with the finished movie. Obviously, the movie did very well. It was one of the biggest movies of 2018. So these decisions, uh, I'm, you you have to see that they only help the the cause and and i personally you know from a technical side of it just found it super interesting uh and while we were talking about that he also mentioned you know, after finishing each project he gets sick he literally gets sick whether it's a cold or psychosomatic or something sort of just this withdrawal from the experience of filming a movie where you spend so much time it's just to anyone who doesn't know when you're making a movie there is no 9 to 5. There's no 5 to 9. When you're making a movie, you eat, breathe, sleep. You live that movie. Every thought of yours is about how are we figuring out some sort of problem, whether it's a creative problem, a technical problem, whether it's a problem we don't even know about. You sort of start thinking like Donald Rumsfeld. There's the known knowns, the unknowns, the knowns we don't know. It becomes so crazy that it, the only way to sort of deal with it is by constantly working on the movie and, and getting to that final product and releasing the picture. So when he said whenever he finishes a project, he would get sick, I totally understood what he was talking about. And it, it sort of, I mean, I always tell everyone when you're obsessed with movies, it's sort of like a drug addiction. And this is the case in point where he spent a certain amount of time working on a movie and afterwards his body couldn't handle not working on that movie anymore. There sort of became a physical uh, addiction to the project. And he said he was speaking to someone on the crew a while ago, a few few projects ago, and the person told him what you need to do is you, you need to get that rush again after you finish a movie. And he told him what he needed to do was jump out of a plane. Now, of course, I'm listening to this conversation. I'm nodding as if everything I'm hearing is normal because – Everyone deals with things differently. You know, if, if I get sick after a project, I'm probably just going to go get hammered and then watch some more movies and work on another script. This guy tells me he jumped out of a plane to deal with the withdrawal of, of finishing a project. And I mean, kudos to him because that is insane. That is insane. To, to jump out of a plane, uh, to deal with having created a picture that ended up being one of the biggest movies of 2018, that's sort of the psychology behind it. I mean, this isn't a profession for for a certain type of mind. You have to have a certain type of mind for it uh, because it's you need to not necessarily, you know, the cliche, think outside the box. You sort of need to live outside the box to, to cope in, in the lifestyle that is making movies. Uh, he said he doesn't jump out of planes anymore after movies, which I'm very thankful for. Uh, instead, now he sort of just takes a vacation, which is something I could much better relate to. Uh, although it's still a little low-key, like I said, after, after finishing a project, you really are just, your energy levels are so high. It, it's You sort of feel like a kid on Christmas uh, where... where you, you need to keep that energy going. It's sort of like 5 o'clock in the morning and you're 21 years old and the club's closing and, and it's like, okay, where are we going to do? How are we going to keep this high going? Uh, and, and that's why a lot of filmmakers, you, you look at their careers and, I mean, you look at uh, Woody Allen, you know, for, for all the things that the controversy around him, the, the man put out a movie every single year for how many decades? Uh, I mean, it's it's ludicrous to think about that to and to write a movie direct a movie produce a movie get a movie out every single year it it is an addiction it's it's more than just an idea of oh i enjoy this it's a hobby that i get to make money off of it's wonderful no it, it it's a physical addiction and woody allen was far from the only one who who operated that way so so to hear stories uh, about someone needing to jump out of a plane after finishing a movie i mean it just makes me want to hear more about how other people go through this this ridiculous process. It's just such an unnatural process to make a movie. And I, I want to hear how everyone sort of deals with it. Because it, if one person jumps out of a plane, what's what's someone else doing? And and hopefully, you know, I get to have more of those conversations and share more of those conversations with you. And again, I'm sorry that unfortunately the, the, the rest of this recording... Uh, 
wasn't captured the way I had intended to because uh, I, I really just enjoyed the conversation. Uh, and we ended up geeking out about movies also. Uh, like all filmmakers, you start dropping names of, of your favorite movies, and we started talking about McCabe and Mrs. Miller and Vilma Sigmund and, and sort of a, a tradition of cinema that, that we could bond over. So it was very exciting, and, and I'm glad you had a chance to, to listen to the first portion of the conversation, which I, I personally found even more fascinating simply because the industry is changing so much. And, and he said it himself where coming out of college, he wanted to have nothing to do with television. He wanted to make movies, as, as most of us do. But what are movies in 2019? What is television in 2019? Things are changing so much that everything that inspired you, you might have a better shot of telling that kind of story in that kind of way on Netflix or on HBO. And, you know, I, I watch a show like The Deuce, and, and to me that's far more cinematic than a lot of the stuff I see coming out from, from major studios and coming out on theaters. So it's going to be interesting to see where the future goes and, and how, you know, the generations that were influenced by cinema and the big screen, how they're influencing the next generation. Where 10 years from now, you're going to have kids coming out of film school saying, oh, I don't want to work on movies. Movies are cheesy, all those superhero movies, because that's sort of the standard now. They're going to say, oh, I want to work on real, real sort of avant-garde stuff. I want to work on real auteur stuff. I want to work on Netflix type projects. And, and that's possibly the future we're headed to and i'm super excited to see it because as long as interesting projects are coming out i get to watch stuff i get to be inspired i get to make my own projects and i get to chat with more people about how they made their projects so thank you for listening to this episode and uh come back next week we'll have something else thank you